A system D vulnerability creates concern, DNS hijacking goes worldwide, and major telcos are still selling location data for their users. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for January 15, 2019, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Starting this month, thanks to our patrons, you can now download ThreatWire via the video RSS at a much smaller file size to help with data caps. It's still at 1080p format, so if you see any kind of compatibility issues, just let me know. And real quick, I would like to give a special shout out to my newest Patreon supporters this week, including Luke, Paolo, Bradley, and David. And if you are interested in supporting ThreatWire and unlocking access to a slew of perks, hit up patreon.com slash ThreatWire. And now on to the news. Security researchers at Qualys sent out a report last week detailing three different vulnerabilities found within System D, which is the default system and service manager for several different Linux distros. Each vulnerability allows a local user to gain root privileges, thereby allowing the user to take control of the machine at an administrative level. Qualys does point out that most Linux distros are, in fact, vulnerable, not including SUSE Linux Enterprise 15, OpenSUSE Leap 15, or Fedora 28 or 29. The three vulnerabilities are CVE 2018 16864, 16865, and 866. The first two pertain to memory corruptions, while the last is an out-of-bounds memory read. This can allow sensitive data to leak from the memory. Each can let the attacker string together a bunch of command line arguments to make System D and Journal D crash. Now, while it crashes, the attacker can take over as root. System D Journal D creates event logs for the machine by collecting information into a journal. Qualys created exploits to test these, and they were able to get root in under 10 minutes on i386 platforms, while taking 70 minutes for AMD64 ones. Red Hat, which is the parent company of System D, has already released patches for two of these issues with a third on the way. Other distros should follow suit very soon, so keep an eye out for any updates. It is advised to update your distro as soon as updates are available. FireEye's Mandiant Incident Response and Intelligent teams discovered a huge amount of DNS hijacking that appears to have stemmed from actors with relationships to Iran. The DNS attack targeted governments, telecommunications, and internet infrastructure companies in the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and North America. Now, we've seen DNS attacks before, but this one is important due to its immense global scale. In fact, it is so large that the Department of Homeland Security has issued an alert about this campaign as of Thursday. DNS stands for Domain Name Server, and it's the technology that links a computer-friendly IP address to human-speak domain name. It's what makes 8.8.8.8 match up with Google.com, for example. The attacks manipulate the domain name server or DNS records, which in turn divert target traffic through malicious servers instead. The attackers use several different encryption certificates and VPS hosts to avoid detection. And while evidence of attacks is minimal, FireEye suspects an actor with ties to Iran because of the IP addresses, even though that's a weak indicator, as well as the motive, since Iranian governments would have lots of interest in data from these places and companies. Mandiant says that the attacks have been happening since January 2017 all the way through this month, and attackers are using three different techniques. The first is by altering DNS A records. The second attack alters DNS NS records, and the third involves using one of the two, then combining it with a DNS redirector. These require some sort of reconnaissance attack beforehand, such as a phishing attack to steal login credentials from admins. Once the attacks are in place, an end user visiting the site in question would not be able to tell the difference, even if their login credentials were getting stolen during the exploit. Now, while it is hard to prevent these kind of attacks, FireEye recommends implementing 2FA if you have not already done so on domain administrative portals, validate any A and NS record changes, search for SSL certificates related to that domain and revoke malicious ones if there are any, validate source IPs and logs, and conduct internal investigations to access intrusions. While little is known about who is causing these incidents, it does go to show that DNS exploits are gaining in popularity with attackers. 
Way back on the 8th of January, while I was still at CES, new site Motherboard wrote about how they were able to purchase for 300 bucks real-time data on a mobile phone user's location within a few hundred meters in accuracy. Finding the location required no special hacking tool or scheme. All it required was a bounty hunter who had access to the data that originally directly came from telcos like AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint. These telcos sell location data to law enforcement, but also to private entities, such as companies like Securus and Microbuilt. Securus and Microbuilt don't do much oversight into who purchases from them. They simply resell the location data to the highest bidder, and oftentimes that could be a stalker, a car salesman, a bail bondsman, a bounty hunter, or in this case, a journalist who is writing a story about the black market of location data. So Motherboard opened an investigation into these matters, which spurred a bunch of news. There's a large supply chain of location data aggregators who sell data to private companies who in turn can sell that data downstream and so on and so forth. The whole time, telcos state that this goes against their terms of service and policies, while users aren't given the option to consent to these smaller companies reaping their location information. All major US carriers have stated that they are winding down or have terminated the selling of location data to aggregators. T-Mobile stated to Wired that they are phasing out the location data sales and should finish that process by March. Verizon published back in summer of 2018 that they too were ending relationships with third-party data aggregators. Sprint denied sharing any location data and AT&T said similar. Hmm. Google Fi, which is an MVNO, requested that their telco partners like T-Mobile not share their customers' location data. But since this process of publicizing the location data shared started early last year in the news, why has it taken it so long for the telcos to actually act on it? Did they even start phasing them out in the first place last year? I feel like they just didn't. And now AT&T is stating that they are cutting ties with aggregators by March, which means they didn't in the first place. So the sheer breach of privacy for individual users has spurred some senators into action. Senators Kamala Harris and Mark Warner have urged the government to investigate, while FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel stated the same. The Committee on Energy and Commerce sent a letter to Ajit Pai and the FCC urging them for an emergency briefing to happen on Monday, so that would have been yesterday, about the location data sharing issue. During the Obama administration, privacy rules were enacted by the FCC to protect consumers by requiring opt-in consent to sensitive data sharing, but those rules were halted by the Trump administration. Later, the FCC prevented another privacy rule from passing during the Trump administration. Now, since the new FCC does not seem very keen on voting for any security-minded rules for consumers, could we even depend on them to penalize telecoms? I feel like we just probably cannot. Real quick, I want to say thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for checking out patreon.com slash threatwire. We did drop below that monthly live Q&A goal, so I'm really hoping that we can get back over that hopefully by the end of this month. That would be awesome. So if you want to support, now's the time to do it. Even if it's just one or two bucks a month, hit that button to become a Patreon supporter because it all helps. It definitely helps fund this show, and it shows me that you appreciate the work that I'm putting in for the show as well. And also a big thanks to our Hush Peppy Perk level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos like this brand new one. He's been waiting to come onto the show, so I'm very excited to show him off. I love him. Keep him coming. Thank you so much. Hit that subscribe button. Share this episode on your favorite social media. With that, I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.